So what is the Atlantic world? That's the central question we really need to dive into here and to understand what's happening in the formation of the United States, but also in this Atlantic world. If you look at the Atlantic Ocean and all the land around that, that creates a new exchange and new identities and new interaction that really is in its own world of its own. And we're going to look at how that developed and how that creates lasting changes and legacies in the world around us today. So uh, there's some things to think about as we go through here. First, get a piece of paper or write some notes as we go somehow of some of these key words here. We're going to look at what the triangle trade is. We're going to look explore the Middle Passage. We're going to look at the Navigation Acts once again in this sort of the realm of the Atlantic world and how at the center of this in this global commerce is a commodification of individuals, the slave economy, and how that not only transforms Africa, but think about as we go through how this whole Atlantic world in general and this the slave economy transformed individual lives and started to create new identities. So think about that and focus on that as we go through the next two part lectures. We're going to keep these short, two little videos, and in between them is an opportunity to do a brainstorming activity to look at some of these main points. So be sure to do that and be sure to check out these, both these videos in full. So write some notes and think about this major question. What ways can we view the triangle trade as a world system of exchange? Now we need to know what the triangle trade is, but we also need to recap and remember what's happening with the world system of exchange. Do you remember? So let's let's look at this from the very beginning of human civilization uh, to understand how world systems exchange it develops and once we finally get to Atlantic world. So if you look at this map here and think about when people first in societies around the world started to settle down, they started to settle down in river valleys. And as they settled down in river valleys, they didn't have to chase their food. They didn't have to go after the original fast food anymore. They were able to watch the plants grow. They were able to have animals domesticate. And of course, that just evolves over centuries and millennia. And as these people settled, they started to create their own identities, their own civilizations, their own cultures, and then interact. And that grew and grew to create new systems. And if we look at the systems here, we can, this is a very crude map of what I've created here. We can look at the world before 1492, largely seen as two worlds. Right, so we have the Western Hemisphere, we have the Americas, and of course this can extend here, but a large, big system, a big system of exchange happening between North America all the way to South America, across to the Mississippi River Valley, and this is its world of its own. But if we look at over here, the Afro-Eurasia world and Australia tying in and what's happening within India and this whole region of interaction and trade, how this interacted for millennia, for centuries, and creating identities and shifts and exchange of people and ideas and, and goods and, and all these things creating a world in its own. So what happened with um, Christopher Columbus, if we look at this really fast, if we see what happens with Christopher Columbus, all he does really is create a new link. And that link grows and grows to create the Columbian Exchange and the Columbian Exchange being the biological exchange of good, pe of, of good, of people and disease and um, different plants and animals. But what about everything else that was happening as soon as Columbus set sail? It created a new world and a world system of exchange of goods, of ideas and disease, right? And people, of course. So if we look at this map, at this little picture here, you could see playing out of goods and of ideas, right? How does this represent ideas being exchanged? And now in the 21st century, we know very well how easy it is to transport disease, right? Better than many generations in the 20th century. We now know, at least the last, late, late 20th century, and we now know in the 21st century more than ever how easy disease plays a central role in interaction of people. So besides just goods, looking at ideas, and looking at disease as well, and people transporting everywhere. So this was the Silk Road, and you can kind of see how it's transporting from one side to the other. During the Roman times, you have Romans that are wearing silk brought over from China, but maybe the people didn't make it, but the goods did. 
Maybe the ideas made it as they traveled. And so the system of exchange shows a world that people don't even have to be there for interaction to happen. Things happen. So even disease can travel by animals. Ideas can travel slowly. You don't need to have someone from one area make it all the way over here. Their idea can travel further. So it's a really interesting th way to think about. And think of in our world today how an ex a world system of exchange plays out and with the new world system of Columbus and Europeans coming over. Right, so one thing we're gonna focus in on here is in back in Jamestown. And what is something that happened in Jamestown is they started to use and exploit the growth of tobacco. And it created a huge phenomenon back in Europe. There was not only the addiction of it, but it became culturally part of the gentrified, the growth of the middle class, all these things tied together with tobacco to allow the Virginia colony to have a strong export as well as a strong demand for labor to be able to um, start exploiting this monocrop system. So there's a lot of ways they were trying to meet the demand of the labor. At first, Sir Walter Raleigh in the very beginning was trying to get the Irish, of course, trying to get them out of Ireland. They're either to breed them out as famously, if you watch Braveheart and you see that with Edward I in that movie. But even in this time period, they're thinking of ways to get rid of the Irish, bring them overseas and use them as a labor force. Of course, they were thinking of ways to exploit the local Indian populations and, and not only their agricultural practices that was completely destroyed with the monocrop system, but to um, figure out a forced labor system of some sort. However, disease plays a limiting factor. You can't have a forced labor if your, your labor force is dying of disease and sick. So they looked to indentured servitude, bringing poor English people and other people across Britain and actually Europe overseas uh, for a short stint of free labor. Sometimes that lasted even longer, sometimes it's shorter, but four to seven years is generally of that, being able to then have freedom thereafter. But that wasn't enough. And it wasn't, uh, you had to keep replenishing the labor force every four to seven years. So it became problematic. So they started to turn to the slave system and a slave economy emerged. So you not only, and that's what happened here in Virginia, but this was happening simultaneously across the Americas. If we look at what's happening with the Spanish colonies, the Portuguese colonies in Brazil, and both the French and the English colonies in the Caribbean, um, you start to see an exploitation of a slave system that's happening and going overseas and racializing and also growing to astronomical sizes that just has lasting effects and devastating effects. So we have to remember a couple things looking at this map. One is the Europeans didn't create a slave system. They exploited it. A slave system, a slave was, was happening since ancient times in Africa. It's been a big part of culture globally. In fact, um, I live in Exeter and there's, a, there's an interesting story of a, a man who was a seafaring man here in Exeter in southwest England. And he was taken on the seas in the 1600s, um, not far from here on the ocean. He was taken uh, by some pirates. He was then sold into the, uh, the Islamic slave trade in Africa, and he was there finally fleeing and finally making his way home. Um, so you see stories of slavery happening globally. But what happened and what developed with the Atlantic slave trade is something completely different. And so exploiting a system that was already in place, but creating it in a new horrific way. So you can look at, we're going to look at Equiano, but if you look at this as what was typical of a slave ship. Remember, if you're thinking of it in a new racial terms, a new way where slavery is racialized and individuals really seen as a commodity, then you're trying to pack as much commodity into a ship, as horrible as that is, that's what they, the mindset was to be able to do that. And please think of that when we read Aquiano and his personal account being one of the people on a ship like this, one of the thousands on here, and what his experience and what he saw firsthand to be able to do this. And this is a recreation of what was going on. 
And it's horrific, but it's important to understand that this is happening in the whole system of people coming over. The, between 10 to 30 million people that traveled across this middle passage, this middle passage slave route into this Americas, this new world. So one thing I want to be able to look at, and one place where I want to stop here for brainstorming, is please look at this map here and um, think about what's happening here and well, let's ex let's explore what this ex tells us about the Middle Passage. Okay, so really, really briefly, you're going to see that between 10 to 30 million people, 10 is the most conservative estimate, traveled from Africa to this new world. Now, 4 to 5 million went to the Caribbean. We have 3.6 to 5 million going to South America here. Um, another half a million going to this part of uh, South America here and traveling to Mexico. So we could kind of say, and, and 0.5 million coming to North America, to the British colonies. So half a million coming here. And then we could say 9 to 10 million, the majority coming here. So my question is this in the brainstorming activity. Why is it that... In comparatively speaking, only a half a million of these slaves came from Africa to the British colonies, whereas the majority, 10 million plus, maybe even closer to 30 million, really took up the bulk of this trade and went to South America, went to the Caribbean. Now, I'll give you a hint. What kind of labor were they being used for in these situations? What kind of labor were the slaves coming over and doing in the British colonies? What kind of labor were they doing in this area here in the Caribbean and South America? How might what they're using the slave force for contribute to how many they, they're bringing over? So think about that in this brainstorming session, and then we'll, I'll pick it up in the second part.